Yes. Holly? Okay. All right. I think I'm ready. Is everybody ready? I can't see you because all I can see is my screen. So welcome. And um, as you can see, I kind of changed my title a little bit. I think you thought you were going to receive a program called Tips and Techniques for Safely Sharing Garden Plants. But I changed my mind as I put this together and it's now called Protecting Our Garden Spaces. Uh, we're gonna talk about tips and techniques for managing our gardens and our best practices for sharing plants to guard against unwanted guests. And now when I say unwanted guests, of course, we're talking jumping worms, but we also don't wanna share creeping bellflower and we don't wanna share Siberian squill or any other crappy weed seeds we might have in our gardens. So the best practices for jumping worms are also good things for um, maintaining gardens and keeping um, invasive species out of our own private spaces. And by doing that, we're also protecting natural areas. So we're gonna cover, um, I'm gonna take you through in six parts. Um, we're gonna talk about um, a little bit of a review from our March 16th presentation. We're gonna talk about some lessons that I've learned from Chicago. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of steps we can take for doing risk assessment for best practices. And then we're gonna go into where we are right now in learning about how to um, do bare roots, which I know is the meat of what we're supposed to be talking about tonight. And um, then a little bit about our studies and clinics. So we're gonna start with the jumping worm review and update. I'm not sure I can't see a show of hands. We're not in a live audience, but I'm hoping most of you have had a chance to watch the uh, YouTube video, or maybe you participated in March for our presentation from Ryan Hoofmeyer, uh, University of Minnesota Duluth, and the Great Lakes um, Worm Watch. Um, that tells you everything you need to know about jumping worms, except what we've learned since then. And this is what we've learned since then. First of all, the good news, I know we're all panicking and we're all scared and we don't know how to identify these and we're wondering if we have them and all of this, but the good news is that there is a treatment that is being researched and it's about two years out. Now, when you received your email reminders today, there was a list of links. Um, they're posted at the end of my presentation, but they are also, um, I have a cat, just a minute. I don't know if you can see me or not, but cat wants to be part of our presentation. Anyway, two years from now, of course, that is a pesticide, which means that opens up a whole other set of issues is if it takes care of jumping worms, which supposedly it's 70% effective, what else does it kill? So we don't know yet. There's also a lot of questions that have been asked about mulch, soil, compost, where to get it, is it safe? How do you know it's safe? And we can reassure you that your um, reputable nurseries, they follow industry standards set by the Department of Agriculture. And that means they are heat treating any soil, any compost, any mulch to 130 degrees, which kills um, worms and cocoons, just like it kills um, weed seedlings and pathogens. So that soil is safe as long as it's been stored in a clean environment. Um, so that's a good news. Uh, there is also new research being conducted here in Minnesota. A lot of the research that you see reports on are from um, the East Coast, Vermont, or from Wisconsin, and it's been moving west. And so the Minnesota scientists, we are so lucky to have scientists like Dr. Lee Freilich, uh, the Landscape Arboretum, uh, Corey Buchholz has been helping me. There is new research that hasn't been published yet but I can tell you that this was shared with me. Um, the hatchling, the hatching begins at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I know Celsius is what scientists use, but I'm gonna use Fahrenheit. Uh, when the top two inches of soil reaches that temperature, primary hatch in Minnesota is May, June, but continues into August a little. And, and this is the bad news, there is some holdover because these cocoons can lay dormant into a second year. Big sigh, gasp, everybody. I know, I was really disappointed to hear that. Um, 
the bulk of the hatching occurs when the soil temperature is 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're gonna see, they're, they're seeing that most of the cracked cocoons they find, the highest quantity is later in July. So that's when most of those cocoons have hatched. Apologies to you that this, um, is this is this thing on my top showing? I, I don't I can't see what you're seeing. So um, apologies to you for my not knowing the exact article that I found this diagram in. I'm gonna have to find it and refine the link. But I love the way this diagram tells about the life cycle of the the juveniles and adults. So we're here in Minnesota in May and June it's mostly juveniles. Now the juveniles don't have that white band that we're so accustomed to seeing as being part of identifying a jumping worm, but they do still thrash around and jump and they're very active. So their activity would be very different than the young juveniles you see from the common night crawlers and other earthworms we're, we're accustomed to. Uh, most of your adults, they start to appear more and more as you go into the fall, and your highest number of adult jumping worms is going to be in the September to October period. And this, of course, is what I mentioned earlier, the cocoons overwinter in soil until the conditions are favorable, and they can continue to hatch in the following year. So if we see jumping worms in our garden this year, they may have been cocoons from 2019, not 2020. It tells us we have to kind of go back in order to go forward. Uh, we know that the juveniles and adults don't survive below 40 degrees or above 100 degrees. So the, the key thing on that 40 degrees, and you're gonna, we're gonna see something on this a little later, is they're gonna move to a warm place, so, you know, near the warmth of a foundation of a house or a sidewalk or something that retains heat. When we have these, if they've hatched and it's in this time of year where we're still having cold temperature, they're gonna look for a warm place to hang out if they've already hatched. Uh, that is the update. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the lessons from Chicago. Uh, when I started learning about jumping worms and started discussing them on, on Facebook, my cat is, making that noise, dog, stop. Um, I was approached by a woman who has been following the um, jumping worms in the Chicago area. And they were first identified there in 2015. So about a five year ahead of us. And if you just excuse me for a moment, I need to get something to stop this cat from making noise. Pause there for a minute. about that. I'm back. If you can see me, this is Dog. He seems to think that he should be having attention right now. So, Dog. Okay, I'm just gonna hold it. So, in these lessons from Chicago, um, I've been able to kind of help to forecast what we're going to be experiencing here in Minneapolis and hopefully learn from what they've discovered after the fact. Um, so, Ann Smith, uh, was the first person to discover and report in a residential garden in 2015. And uh, that was the same time that they were discovered in the Chicago Botanical Gardens. And Ann Smith, Smith uh, did have an article in the paper. It is um, in, your, um, in your links. Uh, one of the things that we're learning about how Chicago reacted is, I don't wanna know about it. It might it might hurt my property value. The realtors don't want to know about it. And that's kind of a sad thing because now we're, we're covering up and hiding from it rather than addressing it head on. And hopefully we can be more proactive here in the Twin Cities area. Now that they're here, we know they're here, but what can we do to slow them down? Um, in the Chicago area, people who have jumping worms have been learning to live with them. Um, they've been finding them in public spaces. It's not a good thing to live with. We really don't want them. Just because they're cute, just because they thrash, just because they're fascinating doesn't mean they're good for our gardens. Um, here is a picture where you can see 
Um, the castings are one of the warning signs that you look for if you see these castings. Now our night crawlers have castings, our other uh, earthworms have castings, but there's just a volume of the castings and a dryness to them that's slightly different. And they're gonna appear in places that you don't ordinarily see castings. Um, the uh, hatchlings are out in late Mar March in Chicago already. And that is probably because we've had that really mild spring where our ground temperature um, warmed up to that 50 to 60 degree temperature. Um, this is another picture from a park in Chicago. And if this scares you, it should, because it scares me. Um, this is what happens when the jumping worms consume the four inch horizon soil layer around a tree that probably was mulched. And then a rain comes and washes away all of the castings because there's nothing to grab onto it. And what you end up with is their roots. Um, in the East Coast right now, one of the trees being affected the most severely from jumping worms are the maple trees. And the maple trees have that shallow root layer that is in that same horizon level, the grasses, that's why it's so hard to grow grass under maple trees. And so they are really at risk from a jumping worm uh, infestation at their base. What they're doing to remedy things once you have them is um, adding soil, adding compost, doing anything to protect those roots, even though the jumping worms will come right back in and consume it, at least it's keeping the plants alive and learning what plants do and don't uh, do well with the jumping worm. Um, the woman in Chicago, um, when we were talking with her, she said she never had a chance to take preventative measures. So if there's something we can learn now, it's what can we do to prevent? And that's what we're really wanting to talk about tonight. Uh, we need to think about how we work with a landscape company, um, how we do things in our own gardens. Uh, she said, stop buying nursery plants, mainly because she'd had a root balled tree that had a cocoon in the root ball. Uh, and again, that had come in contact with soil. It wasn't up on a tray in a nursery setting. So it's a little different than a bare root plant or something that's grown from seed. Um, thinking about barriers, things that you can do to protect your space from these things coming. But what good is a barrier if they can crawl 12 to 15 inches out of a container? So um, that's the learning curve and lessons from Chicago. I'm gonna move now into risk assessment observation and early detection. This is where I'm at personally in my garden. Um, I'm looking back, thinking about what I learned from Chicago, I'm looking back at 2019 and 2020. I have a landscape company who comes and helps me uh, maintain and manage my garden. So did they come from someplace that had uh, jumping worms? Did they move castings? That's a risk fest factor. Um, I'm looking back at the, the, the donated plant sale. A year ago, we debated whether we should have the sale, but we determined that we could do it safely based on what we knew. I'm hoping that we did. We haven't had anybody say that they got anything, but that's why we're not doing it anymore. So, but did I get a plant from a friend? Did I get a plant that was dug up over here and brought it over here? Um, just, you know, what do my neighbors do? Are my neighbors buying mulch from, from a non-reputable company that maybe introduced it there? Did they introduce the jumping worms, which will eventually find their way to me? Here's another photo. Um, and this just shows you what a pile of castings looks like on top of mulch. Um, the jumping worms enzymes are able to break down mulch. So unlike um, your common night crawlers and other earthworms, they do consume that mulch layer. Reflecting back again, there are other things to think about. So what are your habits outside of your garden? I know we all have travelers, like our gardens are like an oasis and you know, people come and go, animals come and go, kids come and go, pets come and go. Where do we go and come back? So our garden oasis has a lot of travelers and visitors. Um, are you an avid hiker? Or maybe there's a member of your family who likes to do off-road cycling or ATV driving, which means they have tires and the tires can pick up um, soil and then they can transfer them from one point to another. Um, do you visit or volunteer in a public garden or natural area? I think before the meeting tonight, Karen was mentioning that 
she was volunteering at the ARB and her, the result of volunteering at the ARB means that she now has jumping worms in her own garden because they came home with her. So sanitation practices, reflecting back, what is my risk level? Well, what are my habits? What do I do? And of course there's kids and life in general. They're gonna happen. They're gonna travel. There's no way anybody is gonna always make sure every tool, every shoe, every groove in that shoe came home without carrying a piece of soil in it. So just, you know, the risk assessment, observation, early detection, learning how to do early detection, you know, kind of what our practice are gonna to be to protect our gardens are very difficult when we have all these unknowns. I did invest in a um, boot cleaner and a brush for my shoes. And I intend to take a box that has a, that's slightly bigger than this, set it in the back of my car. And so that when I do go someplace where I think there might be risk, I can quickly, clean my shoes, contain it in the container, any soil, and then I'm not bringing that home to my garden. You might wonder where your risk is based on where the jumping worms have already been identified. Um, this is a map that I pulled yesterday. It's the EDD map, and anytime you report an invasive species, it gets registered onto this EDD map. Uh, this map large area is the greater Twin City area. I zoomed into South Minneapolis. And then I zoomed in closer to an area not too far from me that's not right adjacent to the Mississippi River. Um, as you can see, there are three points within that, oh, what, five or six or 10 blocks from, let's see, one, two, three, four. Yeah, 10 blocks from the Mississippi River Gorge where there have been confirmed identification of jumping worms. There are actually three points. If you look back here, there are three points that are near the Mississippi River. Here over by the university, they've been sighted in the River Gorge by the U of M. Um, there's a couple of sightings here, one in Seward, one in Longfellow, and there's some across the river, and there's some down in Minnehaha Falls Park. Our parks and our rivers need our help. We really what we do in our gardens, what we do as caretakers of our land, we need to really be vigilant if we're going to protect our park areas while we wait for these treatments to be available. Because that erosion that happened on that tree in Chicago, imagine what would happen along the river gorge if our woodland areas there had an infestation of jumping worms that ate all that soil level and then it just washed down into the river. So yes, there's reason to be concerned, but we can be proactive and we can slow these things down and that's our goal. In identifying those high risk areas in your gardens, we need to think back again to the life cycle of the jumping worms. They like it to be warm. So one of the places where they are first found is near a path, which is probably how they entered your garden or they are in a um, near concrete or a foundation of house because it's warmer. So they, they congregated there in the spring just to be where it was warmer. And now you have all these castings right near the corner of a sidewalk. So that's a good place to look if you think you might have them is places that are warmer in your garden. Maybe the sun hits there first in the spring and it retains some heat. Um, other, other places that are high risk in your gardens are places where you introduce those plants. You know, maybe you have a large acreage, but there was only one part and you just brought in some plants. That's an area that you might want to keep an eye on. Um, the low risk is where you have plants that are introduced from the nurseries who follow all those safety protocols. Um, as Clarence was asking, or no, Tim was asking before the meeting about the plants from Prairie Restos. They're up on racks. They're using soilless medium, and they're following protocols of the Department of Ag. Another place for an uh, idea on how to do early detection in your high risk areas is to do some testing. So one of the things I want to do is I wanna learn how to identify common worms because they wriggle and they move. And is that thrashing? Is it jumping? I don't know because I have never seen a live jumping worm. I've only seen videos. So I wanna know if they're in my garden, but how do I know if I have them? You know, I look at these things, they're squirming, they're moving. So um, 
So one of my goals is to learn to identify other worms while I'm also looking to see and test to see if I have them in my garden. So last year I did what's called the mustard test and that's where you take four ounces of powdered mustard into a gallon of water and stir it around and you mark off like a one square foot area and you pour it and then a few minutes later you pour it again. Now if jumping worms are there they're going to come right away because they're in the top four inches but once you pour further and it goes down deeper, you might have some of your night crawlers that go way deeper that come up. And um, I collected these in a dish and I videoed them and I looked at them and I observed them and I was even measuring them. Most of what I have is a common earthworm um, and I have not found any jumping worms, thank God. Um, but the second thing I'm doing, and this is something I'm doing this year, is I'm taking test soil samples from different areas of my garden and putting them in containers, which will eventually have little air tubes and moisture control. And I'm just going to observe if there's worms living in there. Are they jumping worms? If there's cocoons, will they hatch? And, you know, I'll keep these someplace in a cool but warm, moist conditions between now and the end of the summer and see whether or not anything comes of it. If no jumping worms hatch, and then I put them in a place to store over winter and nothing happens next year, then I'm feeling much safer about my own garden. And these are easy things we can do at home. Moving on to some other best practices. So we've talked about risk assessment. We've talked about how to observe what our early detections are. What are some other things we can do? First, I'm going to reassure you again, because some of you might have missed at the beginning, people come in, the protocols that kill weed seeds and pathogens also kill existing worms and cocoons. That means all of your nurseries that follow those protocols start with a clean, sterile soil. Um, I say existing because again, if you take all of that compost that you've just heat treated and you throw it on a piece of land that is not treated, worms crawl. They move, they may find their way into that pile because now you have that healthy, rich compost, especially compost and mulch. So it's all how they are handled from the time that they are treated to the time they are bagged or, or, or carried or moved to your site. So it's a good question to ask the nursery how their soil and mulch and compost is stored after it's been heat treated. Uh, a couple more observations from my friend in the Chicago area. Um, cedar um, is preferred versus pine bark. So they like to like your cedar and probably cypress as well. Most of the cedar and cypress mulch that we get that's bagged like at big box stores or hardware stores or probably even some of your nurseries, most of it comes from Ohio. And Ohio is an area where they have active jumping worms. So um, that is a risk factor if the protocols are not followed. They don't like pine bark as much. So it's interesting. Um, they might be able to digest it, but if you're looking for a mulch alternative, pine bark is an option. Another observation was that um, in parts of the garden where it's more acetic or if you, if you lower your pH, they tend to move to a place where it's got a higher pH. So they like a more alkaline soil. And I think these are interesting things to learn moving forward as we, as we learn how to live with them when they flourish and when they don't. What are those uh, factors that affect that? We all want to do plant swaps again, and we want to do them safely. We, we want to support garden club sales. We want to be able to take gifts from friends. The safest way to do this is to learn how to do things via bare roots. Where am I on time here? Oh, okay, I've got to keep moving here. Um, and if they're not ready to transplant, to repot into commercial potting soil. And then uh, if we do have plants that are in a soil base, um, we need to isolate them somehow. Uh, we need to isolate, watch them, observe them. Don't immediately put them into our garden because now we've let loose whatever is there. Um, sanitation is going to be a key factor in anything that we do. Um, I do not have good discipline, and I haven't in the past. I mean, um, I, I pick something up, I care it for one point, but I don't care if I spill soil. At least I haven't cared until now. So now when I dig something up, I'm going to 
uh, have a bucket that doesn't have any holes in it. And I'm gonna put it in that bucket and I'm gonna remove most of the dirt, dump it back in the soil, unless I'm soil testing it. But then I'm gonna take that and carry it to the next place or carry it to where I'm gonna be potting it without spilling soil along the way. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Avoid transferring soil from one area of your garden to another because that soil, if you have it in one area, now you might have moved something to the other area. Um, I, another thing I think about is, you know, when I sweep the walk, which I don't do very often, um, I usually pick up the bulk of the stuff and then I go push, 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 and I sweep back and forth and, and put all those crumbs back into the garden. I'm rethinking that. I'm thinking I should sweep and I should take up and I should dispose of things in high risk areas. What's a high risk area? A walkway where people come by, you know, I'm on a city, city boulevard where we have a boulevard sidewalk, kids, bikes, dogs, animals, um, everybody walks, what's in their shoes? What are they leaving behind? Um, if I sweep my sidewalk and contain that, um, then I am uh, risking, reducing my risk. I'm also gonna start disposing of any worms that I find because none of them are native to Minnesota anyway and we have far too many of them. Now to what we're all waiting for and that is how do we do these bare roots? What is a bare root? So a bare root from your nurseries and these are from Prairie Moon is when they take and they re remove a plant while it's in its dormancy, and then they ship it to their customers in kind of like a peat moss and a plastic bag with a certain amount of moisture, and you're told to put it in the refrigerator. So here is some plants I received last fall from Prairie Moon. This is bellwort. I'm, I'm not going to use the Latin names. I, I might go in and add them later, but you know, Mary Bells are Mary Bells. So you can see that this is last fall. So this is this year's spring growth ready to pop out this spring. And over here we have Ruin Enemy. Now very different looking roots. Um, these have these little almost tumorous kind of lookings coming on, very fine textured, whereas this has a little bit more meatiness to the root. Um, we are not doing plant swaps during dormancy, we are in the growing season. So that's a little different. Um, last fall, Vicki Bonk came over and we were planning this presentation to be a live in-person meeting um, for our April table topics. So we were trying to figure out how do I have live plants in April? So we were digging up plants, bare rooting them and then repotting them into clean soil. Uh, so here you see me taking a pot. Now this plant, this does have holes in it. So I, I, my protocol of the pot of the container that doesn't have holes, I, I, I wasn't there yet last fall when I was learning, but I am kind of loosening most of the soil from that plant. Um, here's one example from last fall. I dug up this nice mass of sensitive ferns. I don't know what these looks like. I'm not a plant biologist or scientist, I, you know, I'm, I'm a gardener like most of the members of our club are, are of wild ones are, that just kind of learns as I go. So we dug up this mass of uh, sensitive fern, I discovered it. it's a very shallow but very dense root mass. And in order to get all of the soil off of that, we needed to really use a water wash. And so we rinsed it and rinsed it till we till we thought that we had almost all of the soil off of that. And then we put it in a container to um, overwinter um, for the presentation this spring. So um, these are all of the plants that we planted last fall. I put some snow on them to try to slow them down. Whoops. I, I covered them with snow to try to slow them down when we had that heat spell because I, I didn't want them to come out of dormancy yet. But as you can see, um, they're laying on the frozen ground over winter in trays. But then what did I do in the spring? Because I don't want, if I have worms, I don't want them to come up into those nice clean pots. I elevated them onto the racks and now the squirrels have dug through about half of them. So who knows what'll survive? I can tell you that this far end is sensitive fern and it did survive the winter. The one that doesn't look like it survived is the uh, celandine poppy, but I won't know for sure until it's a little warmer. And just out of curiosity, I noticed a queen bee two days ago climbing into this space underneath. So I might have to leave that there for the season. That's a good thing though. 
this spring, we've learned a lot over the winter, we've done some research. So now we're trying to figure out how we could do this in a more citizen science consistent manner in doing uh, plant trials where we're practicing doing these bare roots. So uh, in preparation the day before, anytime, anything you remove, anything you want it to be well hydrated. So just a reminder that if you're planning on digging plants, if it hasn't been raining, you do want to water them the day before. Uh, you want to set up a workspace. Um, you see a, a collection of things I have here. I have a broom, a dustpan, I have rags, that's for cleaning off my tools. Um, I have big deep buckets, one for water, one with a lid, if I have things I need to contain with a lid. I have um, all kinds of miscellaneous container, an old dish pan, um, an, an old um, deep tote, uh, cake pans, trays, buckets. These things don't have holes in the bottom, so I'm able to um, move them around without spillage. That is the key thing. Uh, these are tools that we clean. We clean them in between each dig. We clean them into a bucket of water. And then in terms of disposing of that water, I filtered it. This is a filter that I got that, from the paint store. And the only uh, muddiness that came through was a very fine sediment. So nothing that is under a one millimeter like a cocoon. So I feel relatively safe in dumping that water. And here's the, the things we'll be setting up for our, um, when we do clinics and trials and testing, uh, people who help us teach will probably get a couple of these buckets. These are the containers I collected my soil in, made sure they had lids that sealed. Uh, if, I, if I'm gonna be doing workshops where I have people bring things to me that are in a plastic bag or container that will bear root during the clinic, then I'm gonna put a nine by 12 plastic tarp under our work surface. And uh, these little uh, natural bristle brushes, if you have sandy or loam soil and it's relatively dry, you can clean the roots using these really soft brushes. If you have clay like me, you might need to wash them and dunk them because the clay sticks. So that's some of the setup and preparation. Um, now here is the first thing, now Karen Graham came over on Friday and we did our first bare root workshop clinic study. Uh, and so we excavated three sites in my garden. Okay, somebody's got their, somebody has to turn mute, please. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I invested in is a little, uh, just at the hardware store garden center, a little soil moisture test, and this is a meat thermometer. And so I know it's not um, university grade scientific, but it tells me what my soil temperature is, and it tells me approximately how much moisture. Uh, this first dig was this little patch here by a sidewalk. This is a high risk area because it's by a walk, and it's near an area where I do a lot of my um, potting things. It's near the garage where I have my workspace. So this is a high risk area. Um, I'm digging Virginia water leaf and wild ginger, which volunteered there on its own. I believe both of these did. And so we dug those up. Now note here that the soil temp is roughly, it's over 60 degrees and it's dry. And notice there's no leaves on top of the soil. Oh, we found a worm. Um, this is likely, and I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, Aporectodia, that's just saying it phonetically. I, uh, I, I sent a video of this to Ryan Hoofmeyer to ask him if he could confirm that it was an Aporectodia species. And he says, oh, send me a closer picture and I can identify it more accurately. And I says, no, all I needed to know is that it wasn't a jumping worm. That was all I wanted to know. And so it is not. Um, here is the root mass from the wild ginger after it's been clean. You can see that there's very little soil, if any, left in those roots, but it is quite a tangle of roots. You can also see we have the tub underneath. And we have a tray so that we're collecting everything. Um, there's no spillage onto my driveway. The end results of this particular specimen was that we had um, the soil temp was 64, air temp 56, it was dry soil, 
And now we have a Virginia water leaf specimen that we photographed. And we have a wild ginger root, bear root that we photographed. Um, it says we found live worms. I just made those notes so that we remember, but they weren't jumping worms. I will say that uh, I gifted these to neighbors. They were expecting them, but not everybody picked them up right away. And the viability of the ginger was it did very well for a couple of days without going into the ground. The viability of the uh, Virginia water leaf, it started to wilt more. So it needed more tender, loving care. Um, here's the Virginia water leaf in a wet paper towel, which is part of the process that we're working on is how do we keep them alive from the time you dig them to the time they're moved. And then uh, something I read on one of the research was is you can roll that into a newspaper to keep your live leaves from breaking. It just kind of protects them and gives them a little bit of a structure. So that's bundled and ready to get. Um, the second area we went to in my garden was an area next to my front sidewalk, again, a high risk area. And here I dug up some Solomon seal with Karen's help. Uh, we re removed excess soil into a container that I'm going to set aside. Uh, here we cleaned them like we did the others. This is just an example of a bucket of water where you can actually rinse and see the roots. And everything that is, um, I don't know if cocoons float or if they sink yet. I'm not so concerned about it as long as they're not sticking to the plant. But here is the um, starry Solomon seal bare root ready to wrap. Here we had a soil temp of 54 and a air temp of 57 and the soil was dry medium. Now this is an area where we have leaves. It's a little bit more shaded and the soil is more moist and the temperature is lower. Now those leaves help keep your soil cooler and they also help keep moisture in. So that's another benefit of not raking your leaves. Um, if we have a drought in the spring, those leaves, leaves may be what saves your plants. Here is the third area that we did a sample, and this is Golden Alexandra, Golden Alexander. Now my soil, I have a little bit of loam on top of heavy layers of clay in my garden. And um, this particular one had a medium to wet, right in the, right in the middle there, medium moisture level. Uh, the soil temp was, I believe it was, looks like it's 54, 55, something like that. And as you can see here, we found a worm. We found a worm in every single dig we did. And every one of the worms was not a jumping worm. Um, but it just goes to show how active the worms are in our gardens. And they are not our friends. I mean, they, they consume our duff layer by maybe the middle of July in my woodland garden. All those leaves that I didn't rake are already broken down much more quickly than needed because of worms. Um, but here you can see how dense and sticky that soil is. Um, this particular plant we needed, the brush didn't work. We needed to actually uh, really wash it heavily in the water to get everything off. The one thing fascinating is, you know, I don't know these plants and roots. I've never looked at them bare before, but the one thing fascinating about Golden Alexander is that it, the roots are like an octopus arm coming out. I couldn't lay it on its side to take a picture. I had to stand it up because that's the way the roots wanted to grow. Um, it also meant that when I put that wet paper towel around it, it didn't make a nice, neat little compact package. I had to fold creatively to protect that plant. But these plants are now all ready for sharing. They're bare root, they're safe. Even if you have jumping worms in your garden, if you are thorough about how you bear those roots, and I mean super thorough, if you know you have jumping worms like that wash, then you um, are likely to be able to share them. However, if you do, you must let your recipient know that you have jumping worms so that they have that added level of caution. That is it for where we're at in pictures and story of the trials where we're at so far. We are at the beginning of this. Where we're gonna go now is to continue to do our studies and clinics throughout the summer. And I'm hoping that some of you will participate. Um, we have more questions than answers. And that is why we do research and studies is to find those answers. Um, some of the questions 
and knowns is we really want to know about plant stress. We want to know about um, how we can reduce that plant stress. Like are there techniques that we can do that will make it easier to keep that plant alive until it's planted? How many hours or days from the day to transplant? Um, do some plants that rely on microbes, are they gonna suffer from the kind of bare root treatment that we're doing? And then there are those difficult plants, the ones with really dense roots where you can't get in there to get them clean or really fragile roots that break easily. Uh, this is all things we want to learn and kind of document as we go forward. I did find an article, it was in a question and answer thing where Sarah Phillips, who has 25 years of gardening experience, had responded um, to this forum. Uh, and I was looking for questions online about how long can a plant survive without soil before transplanting? That was the question I put into the internet. And um, what came up was this information from Sarah. She talks about a fleshy root, thick roots where the plants store foods, they'll last longer outside of soil. Plants with rhizomes like irises, they could be stored for several weeks or even months, um, but you have to check them regularly. Um, fibrous wood plants are a little trickier because they don't have the resources in the root to survive long periods of time. Um, and they are going to be able to be stored at a shorter period of time. Um, and all of these plants in our winter area, if all of you are from Minnesota, we are in the colder climate. So these rhizomes are going to do well, especially native plants, um, in a refrigerator or a cool setting um, while you wait for them to be planted. So don't set them out in the sun and let them bake. They'll die much quicker than if you have them in a cool, shady area. Um, these clinics, like I mentioned, they're going to be coming on in the summer. Um, I'm thinking maybe setting up twice a week where I just have maybe Thursday afternoon and Saturday morning is something I'm thinking about doing, uh, weather permitting, just to kind of set some regular schedules and, and maybe set it up on Sign Up Genius if people want to come. Um, in the April, May period, would be we'd be looking for cocoon, we'd be protecting against cocoons, but we'd be looking for hatchlings in the soil. So we would be looking for the little tiny, um, really wiggly worms. If we see those, then we're going to be knowing that that garden has jumpy worms. June, July, August, um, those juveniles are a little bit bigger. Um, most are starting to have hatched. Um, it's not a good time for doing transplanting because it's hot unless we're digging things that have already gone into dormancy and are safe to dig and move. Uh, September, October, that's um, a time when we have a lot of adult activity. So if we're doing bare wood transfer clinics there, we're really gonna be looking for those adult worms. Our goal is to build a team of leaders. Maybe some of you will become a leader um, and conduct the clinics and develop guidelines and hopefully bring these clinics and demonstrations once we can meet in person again, maybe bring them into a community um, outreach that's happening somewhere in your neighborhood um, where we can bring some samples and show. I think one of, the, one of the biggest fears is even people who buy plants, you know, they're root bound. They don't know you can cut those roots that are root bound and that you actually have an older plant that just hasn't been repotted yet. So I think learning about um, the plant roots is something all of us can benefit from. And I don't think we have to be afraid of it. I think it's something we can embrace and learn and say, hey, this is a new way of doing things. I like this. I, it's not as heavy, it's not as, as muddy, and it's easier to do. And then of course we want, and I'm hoping those neighbors that I gave the plants to, I want people to report back on the successes and the failures, especially the failures, because if we're doing something wrong, we need to know how to correct that action. And um, as far as building those leaders and conducting clinics, this summer we're going to be doing all summer. And then over the winter months, we'll be collecting data from people on what they've learned. And hopefully um, over the course of the winter, we can put together some sort of a pamphlet or a brochure. Our education committee can work on this communication committee where we can kind of outline what practices that we've determined are the best ways to do bare rooting in your garden. Um, what are some of the risk factors? What are some of the plants that we learned? We'd like to build a database of, of plants that we've already done bare root plants 
uh, transfer zone? Was it spring? Was it summer? Was it fall? How much was the plant stressed? So that we can kind of collect data and make it easier for gardeners to not be afraid to take these steps in their gardens. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, quick thanks to Karen, Jessica, Marilyn, Vicki, uh, a citizen scientist consultant in uh, the Chicago area, Martha Hellander, and of course, University of Minnesota, Ryan Hoofmeyer and Carrie Buchholz for helping me with some of the science-based information. And these are the links that I told you about in the article. Um, Ryan Hoofmeyer's presentation is a YouTube. Uh, this will also be recorded onto our YouTube channel. Um, and um, the citizen science opportunity, we can all start to look and contribute to the Great Lakes Worm Watch. Um, Brad, Brad Herrick is the researcher in the uh, University of Wisconsin. And uh, April 1st was when they did a story on the uh, potential treatments. And so that's another name to watch. He's right up there with Ryan Hoofmeyer, Hoofmeyer and Dr. Lee Freilich. Um, the uh, information that verifies the heat treatment is in this article. Uh, this is the Ann Smith story about the woman in the Chicago area that I was telling you about. Um, and this is uh, the University of Minnesota and also the Minnesota Heart Society both have guidelines for when you are doing plant shares, um, how to make sure you're doing them safely. And of course, growing things from seed, that's totally safe. And that's gonna be our presentation in the May meeting is growing things from seed. Uh, that's one way to completely avoid uh, sharing soil. And then of course, here is a link to the EDD map and I'm going to end it there. and ready to take questions. Julia, thank you so much. I, I'm gonna give you a round of applause on behalf of all, like, all the silent faces <laughs> that you're not looking at. Uh, honestly, it was really, really sweet. I felt like you were really connecting to us with your presentation. I, your presence in person is ultimately better, but that was really lovely. Um, I'm gonna whip out a couple of quick questions here. One is once plant roots are cleaned, can they be planted immediately into sanitized pots and potting soil? Most definitely. And that is something that any of us can do if we're digging plants and we wanna share them. We don't have to go through the process of wrapping them in a wet paper towel and putting them in a newspaper. We can pot them up and just make sure that wherever you place that plant isn't on the ground. Can you put them in a bucket of water rather than newspaper if it's just to you know, keep them from you drying You can out? for a short period of time, but some plants don't like to be overly wet for too long. And I think that's something that we're gonna learn as we move forward is how long something can be viable in water. Um, some plants would probably do fine in water for multiple days. Some plants might get root rot or other things and we don't know those answers yet. Excellent. And that's part of the studies. And with if you've got some funky roots and they're just really that funky can you can you trim them up a bit or is this another probably learning bit with um yeah you can you can trim them up a bit um it's kind of like you prune a tree you prune a, a plant above ground the roots are just the the reverse of that they're the underground component so as long as you're not taking away too much volume you can certainly um prune away a little bit of that root and i thought what was really also sweet about those photos that you've taken of your plants is I thought the roots looked healthy um, as another indicator you are not infested yet. Um, would you agree your the roots looked healthy? Well, you know, that's that's dependent on what the plant, you know, I, I have healthy garden soil. I mean, I haven't done anything to my yard other than let the leaves decompose for 13, 14 years now. So I have a nice, healthy top layer of soil in my garden, even though the earthworms consume a lot of it. So the plants in my garden are healthy. Um, one of the pictures I didn't show you was um, two years after having jumping worms, um, my friend had a, um, oh, I'm drawing a blade, um, Jack, Jack in the pulpit. And they usually have those big, red, beautiful berries. And in year three of having jumping worms, the berries were, eh, some were red, some were kind of rotting, some of them looked like they weren't healthy at all. So 
it is possible that the plant health is affected by the jumping worms, even though it might look like it's okay at the beginning of the season, it might be affecting them in different ways. So, and that's all part of our studies and shared knowledge and part of what is beautiful about wild ones. And what we're doing is we're trying to share this knowledge. Excellent. And then can you to quickly or quickly, can you in some sort of time frame um, talk about earthworms? Because I don't think we're, um, so we're, these are new worms. Like, can you back up and talk about how earthworms play a role? Okay, well, first of all, I encourage everybody to watch Ryan's presentation or any of the um, videos out there that are talking jumping worms, because they're going to talk to you a little bit about the difference between earthworms and a little bit about how they were introduced to areas that were glaciated through various aspects of travelers, you know, oasis back to travelers. So earthworms, night crawlers, night crawlers really go very deep into the soil. Uh, some are more shallow, some are smaller. I've had some earthworms this year that I swear are six inches long already. They and were this... old, they, they were night crawlers that's, that crawl down deep below the frost line and they survive. So the, the worms we're seeing right now in our gardens in Minnesota are most likely not jumping worms if they're any bigger than an inch to an inch and a half long and wiggly. Simply and because... they're good? So I see them no. in my garden and that's a good indication of health? Well... It just means that they're everywhere. Fishermen like them. They're all over the place. Um, some gardeners like that they aerate your soil, um, but in, in naturalized gardens, they're not such a good thing because what they do is they consume that duff layer. And that duff layer is really an important level of nutrients for our soil health. And it feeds so many of our favorite spring ephemerals and our tree roots. So um, that leaf layer that disappears by mid-July because of earthworms and night crawlers, that's not natural here in Minnesota. So I don't feel bad now. I, I have this new motto, when in doubt, toss them out. So I'm going to keep a bucket that has a closed lid on the top of it. Oh, and I started a worm farm. I scraped uh, an area of soil that was in an area on top of some bricks that... Um, I, you know, the leaves decompose there. So it's nice, rich soil, prime ground for jumping worms to like that kind of soil. And I put it into a container and a lid and I'm gonna put a glass lid on it. And any worms I find, I'm gonna throw them in there. And then I'm gonna see whether or not I have any hatchlings of uh, jumping worms in that container. So, and I don't mind if any of those worms die because they're not natural to my area anyway, so. Um... Should, okay, so I've got a bunch of compost potting soil questions. So it's, should I not use compost from the city compost site? Can, do I have to be concerned about purchasing potting soil? And if we know the bulk compost is safe to buy from places, and do we know if bulk compost is safe from places like Kieran's or Gurton's? So your nursery trade has been aware of this for longer than we have. Um, they work with the IPM specialists and the leaders out of the Arboretum. And um, they have been already on their guard on this for probably two years. I started questioning friends of mine that have nurseries last year. And yes, the word is out there. So they are, first of all, they have the protocols in place. The main thing to be concerned about is how it's stored. So once something lays on a ground, that has jumping worms, it is no longer risk-free. Even if it's in a plastic bag, if there was a hole in the bag, you never know, it is not 100% risk-free. So really, you just need to be, I don't want people to stop thinking they, they can't buy mulch anymore because mulch is something that we use. I mean, I'm thinking living mulch, like what they're selling at the plant sale is to get living mulch and skip this and you know use your leaves and stuff. Um, the city compost sites are usually direct from the trees that are pruned and trimmed by the city and dumped. I would take from the top of the pile, not the bottom. So if you're getting out your shovel and you wanna get that mulch, look to see when they first do a load and then climb up to the top and don't scoop from the bottom because that bottom is where you're coming into contact with the ground. And if there's jumping worms on the ground, that's where they're gonna infiltrate and infest that pile of mulch. They're not gonna climb up to the top when they got that nice warm layer at the bottom. 
They are going to move away from heat though. So if you're creating heat in that pile of compost, they're gonna to move to a place where they can survive because the adult and juvenile worms, their, their life cycle, their temperature tolerance is 40 to 100 degrees. Cocoons for three days at 72 hours at 100 will kill cocoons, which is why we know they'll die in a compost heating because it's gradually bringing it up to that and takes a while to get up to that 130 degrees. So um, just be aware, uh, if you know somebody who's a tree pruner, ask them if they can just give you part of a load or have a bunch of neighbors share a load. Just see if you can have it set on top of a nice clean slab of concrete or in somebody's empty garage, somewhere where it's not coming into contact with soil that may or may not be uh, infested. Does that make sense? Indeed. Uh, will you have a copy of your slides available? I have not thought about that. I mean, it's being recorded. So I'm assuming that you could go back and watch and do a screenshot if you wanted to. Sounds good. Um, in August of 2020, the Minnesota DNR put out a warning to the public about wood mulch spreading jumping worms. And if the Arboretum is on their guard about jumping worms, how did they get infested with them? Well, you know, what I was saying earlier is you don't know the infestation for two years after you had that cocoon. So it is very difficult to detect how something entered a space. It could have tracked in on somebody's shoe. It could have come in, like I'm talking with the person who works in my garden now and I'm asking them what their protocols are, cleaning their tools from one site to a next. And, and in fact, I'm using it as um, helping that business from a liability. I mean, the last thing I'd want to be is a landscape company that accidentally gave five of my clients jumping worms because I didn't take care of my tools between sites. So we, these, these cocoons are between one millimeter and five millimeters. Most of them are in that two to three millimeter and they look like a grain of soil. So how in the world do you, when you're working and you're hot and you're warm, how do you not accidentally carry something with you from one site to another. And then it can lay dormant until the, it's late. And then you don't notice the first year because they're so small that you really, you know, it's a large, Arboretum is a, a large site. I mean, how would they notice one little spot unless somebody was surveying every spot of land on every day. And then all of a sudden it's carried to a new site. So it's, the spread is scary how quickly they can spread. Uh, and that's why we want to really do as much as we can to prevent and really learn new sanitation methods in our gardening practices. It's kind of like COVID, you know, all of a sudden we're washing our hands all the time. We're putting on masks, you know, we're kind of doing that against jumping worms right now in our gardens and Siberian squill and other things. And, and now we've just learned recently that the lesser selenine poppy is in Swedes Hollow in St. Paul. And that's a hugely devastating um, invasive weed that it that covers large swaths of land. So I mean, it's just, just to be present in terms of where we're at and whether or not if we're going into natural areas to really be cautious about not introducing something to a natural area, going from point A to point B, and, and tell our neighbors and talk to people about it. I can't believe how many people even though I've seen it on the media multiple times, I mention it to people and they haven't heard anything about it. It's like, oh, I hadn't heard about that. So we just need to get the word out there and really work to slow it down while we wait for some sort of a method to fight these things. So uh, last, it looks like I've got last question and then um, presumably we should wrap her up. Um, it is, does vinegar kill them and their cocoons? That is a very good question because vinegar is um, a low pH. So it may slow them down or they might just run away to another site that has less vinegar. Um, I know that I'm thinking, I'm thinking if I find an infestation in my garden and it's really small, I might invest in a weed torch and take that weed torch and just heat up that area where those jumping worms are and then make a bigger circle and just heat them until I think that I've eradicated that little patch. I mean, that's one of the thoughts that I have in terms of if I find them in my garden, um, because um, I don't want them 
you know, I, yeah. I, they're, they're half a block north of me, you know, so I, that's what, you know, a tenth of a mile, less than a tenth of a mile away from my house is one of the confirmed sightings. You know, it's the alley, it's the alley that's on the opposite end of the alley of my house. So somebody, some kid comes down the alley and, you know, goes playing around, who knows, you know, I, I just, I just want to be vigilant. So I don't Absolutely. want, based, based on what I've seen, I really don't want them. So. Well, I sure think your presentation has been very helpful to, to see the ways that we can monitor, to see how you monitored. I think your pictures were super helpful um, to, to give us uh, some of the tools we'll need to keep an eye for it and to share with others as we can. So uh, and turn it over uh, for final messaging before we end the meeting. Uh, Karen or um, Holly, do you want to say anything else about the plant sale? This is usually our plant sale kickoff time and a lot of people joined after the chat. We have our, if you go- Thank to you everyone. So. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Jessica. And if you go to our website, our plant sale page is live and um, you can purchase plants. All sales are online through Eventbrite and um, sales end uh, Wednesday, May 19th, and pickup is June 4th, 5th, or 6th at Prairie Restorations in Princeton.